Welcome everyone. Um, so this is going to be a welcome break from our usual service and our standard meeting agenda, which it sounds like people are looking forward to that. So that's good. Uh, so we've got a really nice um, session planned um, for you um, all around the topic of ethnic inequalities and mental health in primary care. Um, so the main kind of highlight of the session is going to be two talks from our Welcome Trust uh, PhD students, Hassan and Aaron. Um, so both have been doing some great work involving and engaging underserved communities in their mental health um, research. Um, so we've also planned some discussion questions as well for you. And we've got an exciting movie premiere courtesy of Hassan, which I say it's a video animation, but it's, it's worth waiting for, I think. Um, so I think just to help get us started and thinking about culture and diversity, uh, we thought we'd just pose a couple of questions to the audience, to yourselves. Um, so the first one really is, what is your favourite aspect of another culture? So we'll just give you a few minutes, just to have a think about that and get you to put some answers in the chat or you can turn your mic on and, and explain yourselves. Quick answers coming in, food, be a popular one. Be the speech. I love hearing people's kind of lives and stories, and so not just kind of you know academic culture, but how it really, yeah, it sort of has affects people's lives. Food, language, social conventions, connectedness, community, more food, language, folk stories. Be nice if there's people to put their their mics on and. Can understand a little bit more about what you mean. Um, Joe, what, what what do you mean when you talk about social conventions? And the, the way that we interact with each other, just more broadly, that the, there are ways that we, we have coded ways of, of engaging with each other that might be quite tacit and never really understood, but to hear from other people and how they engage with each other, it, it's really illuminating. Thank you. Perhaps you have just seen you put family structure in. I'll excuse the typo, but um, can you explain a little bit more about that? I think just how everybody, I think from different cultures, have different familial ties, um, different bonds, like in some families you're closer to your like siblings, whereas like I think more nuclear family structure, it's just more about, I guess, the immediate family. And it's just interesting just to see, I guess, how relationships are across different communities and cultures. Thank you. Got some some similar themes coming out, I think, anyway, as well. We've got music as well, um, a lot more about family. Um, anybody with a burning desire to talk about their, their comment in the chat? Perhaps somebody you haven't heard from yet. Um, I, uh, as a practice nurse working with Pakistani families, I was really struck by how um, how people with learning disabilities are embraced within the community in a way that I just haven't seen anywhere else. That, that stayed with me. It's a really nice reflection. Thanks, Jo. OK, so I think that's got us the appetite whetted, I think, in terms of culture and diversity. I'm going to ask you a bit more of a or research specific question now. Um, so in the context of supporting ethnic diversity and inclusion, if you could change one thing about research, what would it be? Put that question in the chat so you've got it there. Up from Alex. Yeah, yeah. I think that there's a um, there's definitely a move towards kind of co-produced um, methods of research and stuff. But I think that whoever the kind of target um, group is that any research is going on about, there should always be a um, understanding and decision made amongst every 
everyone, any kind of stakeholder in any research of how that research should be conducted. Yeah, absolutely, I think so. Embedding that kind of right from the start, isn't it, as well, rather than when the researcher says it's okay for girls to engage, yeah. Health literacy, yeah. and yeah, more participatory research. Clear results that benefit the community, yeah. Greater representation, yeah. And how do we achieve these things, I suppose? How do you achieve greater representation? Um, that was me who made that comment. I think it needs to be about like this, um, how people are sampled for like oversampling of different um, minority ethnic groups so that they can be, you know, um, you've got numbers to be able to understand what's going on within um, those groups. We've been doing work in like a range and we've merged together a range of <laughs> data sources and we still haven't got the numbers to answer some of the questions that we'd want to answer. So I think a lot of work needs to be done in that area. Thank you. Um a couple of people have mentioned ethics committees perhaps being a bit of a barrier. I'm trying not to say that personally because I sit on an ethics panel. But um, so what what can I do? What can we do to help support research in with these groups and communities? I think Joe and Mao, you've both mentioned ethics. I think um, in terms of kind of ethics, it's it's thinking a bit about. Um, you know what what the purpose of those forms is it often feels a bit like you know you've got to include all this information or we're not covered but that's not really you know still meaningful consent if people um aren't really able to grasp what you're trying to communicate through them you know even translating them isn't actually that helpful because even english speakers often struggle with the you know, language that's asked for. So I think, you know, thinking a bit more realistically about how they'll be used and, and how they'll be interpreted by potential participants. Thanks for um, for sharing that and adding to your comment. That's really helpful. Um, Aaron, you've mentioned cultural humility. I'm not going to let you get away without expanding on that. Uh, yeah, how do you define vulnerability? And I, I think Hassan helpfully kind of elaborated a bit more that there's definitely this idea of mutual respect that's there and kind of giving a validity to, to different views, even if actually they're, they're not necessarily agreed with by by all parties and just trying to get a, a greater understanding and respect, respect for differences and also, I guess, shared um, shared values as well. Um, but I guess it's the time, the willingness, the patience, the energy that's needed to do that is uh, and sadly neglected in the short time frames and limited funding that, that we have. But that's really important and needed. Thanks, Aaron. And Jane, it'd be nice to hear from our PPIE rep. You mentioned about researchers going into communities. Is it, is it, is it important for the researchers to be seen, do you think? Community? Yeah, definitely. It, it, it's a huge thing walking into a university as a member of the public. Um, you know, and sitting with other people. Yeah, and feeling that your voice is, is important. Um, and that's even harder when you're in a community that, you know, where there are, you know, rules for want of a better word on on speaking to people and, and allowing people into into communities. And I don't think sometimes we try hard enough with seldom heard communities. Lex, you've got your it's hand a, up. It's quite often Sorry. a tick the box. So, Thanks, Jane. But we're getting there. We're getting there because we're we're acknowledging that it's a need. Alex, sorry, had your hand up. I think with that that Jane was just saying is uh, around rebalancing kind of power dynamics and making sure that if we're going into other people's spaces which I think is the right way to do it rather than expecting people to come to you. Um, 
then all that needs to be taken into consideration but also the the kind of rules and regulations around research that you're doing I'm not a researcher person so I don't know <laughs> all of this but I think it's it, coming from someone that doesn't know all that terminology then I think it's really important that the terminology is laid out at the beginning with the people that are involved uh, and getting information from so that that understanding and the rules are made together rather than kind of from a committee or from um, people that know what all those words mean. <laughs> Hit the nail on the head there so yeah real collaboration isn't it working at that kind of level I think yeah because really we've got some really good um, comments in the chat as well. Um, so Abigail came up with a very practical solution around funding for interpreting services uh, so we can include more diverse groups. Um, it's, a, it's a shame really when funding becomes the, the issue really when we say we're only including English speaking participants. I always think that we have a pang of guilt when we write that into an application. Um, it's a very practical solution. More thoughts about ethics? Shouldn't have focused on that, should I? Rethinking anonymity, that's interesting, yeah. That's interesting, yeah. So maybe offering participants the opportunity to be to be named in the research. That would be really interesting. OK, well, thanks so much for, for engaging that. It's been really helpful just to kind of set the scene and get get people focused, I think, in terms of um, culture and, and ethnic diversity. So um, I think that's enough for me anyway. So I think I'll hand over to um, Hassan first um, for his presentation. And then we'll move on to, to Aaron after that. So over to you, Hassan. Uh, thank you. I'll just uh, upload the file one second. OK, um, can you see my screen? Yeah, OK, yeah. great, thanks. Um, so yeah, th thank you for uh, uh, for inviting me today. Um, so I'll be talking a, a bit about my uh, PhD journey uh, around emotional distress, anxiety uh, and depression in South Asians uh, with long term conditions. Um, so I'll be um, doing a presentation uh, of the systematic review, the qualitative study, uh, and talking about implications and conclusions. And particularly for this kind of uh, meeting, uh, and I've only got around 15 minutes or so, I didn't want to talk in too much details regarding the methodology and things like that, but more in terms of hopefully to spend a few minutes in terms of lessons learnt working with underserved communities. So whilst it's kind of slightly methodology light uh, presentation. I'm happy to discuss further and talk another time and, and go into those details later. Um, but there's a kind of I think there's a, there's a real kind of theme and message that I hope to uh, uh, to, to bring across in, in, in this presentation. Um, so a, a bit of brief background, uh, people with long term conditions are more likely to have depression than any other condition uh, and people with physical and mental health comorbidity have got poorer quality of life, worse clinical outcomes and increased mortality. People from some ethnic groups are less likely to recognise and seek help for symptoms which may represent mental health problems and they're underserved within healthcare services. South Asians um, from an, a number of different countries uh, and around 7.8% of the UK population around 0.6% uh, of trials population and in terms of patient and public involvement are around 3% 3 so in, in many ways an un, uh, underserved group within research and they've got a higher prevalence uh, of long-term conditions. So what did I do? Um, so I, I did a, a systematic review um, looking at how uh, people of South Asian origin uh, with long term conditions, understanding, experience and seek help for, for emotional distress, which informed the qualitative study, um, which was uh, interviewing 17 South Asian men with diabetes and or heart disease, uh, as well as 18 GPs. And we had a patient advisory group uh, of five South Asian men who inputted uh, throughout the research from conceptualising the research 
asking the research questions to the very other end of of, of dissemination um, and future research steps. Uh, and they're actually quite keen to kind of work together uh, for the future, which is nice as well. Um, so, you know, very briefly, uh, it was a qualitative uh, systematic review uh, exploring emotional distress. Um, and we looked at eight databases, thematic analysis, and we used the critical appraisal uh, skills program to look at the quality of articles and then something called grade sequal to, to look at the overall quality or the overall strength of evidence. Um, and again, like I said, I'm happy to discuss these points in a bit more detail um, with, with, with any questions. Um, but from uh, just under 4,000 papers, uh, 21 were included in the systematic review uh, and they, they in included research from a number of different countries um, and people with diabetes, coronary heart disease, uh, uh, as well as uh, both. Um, and there were around uh, 600 uh, South Asians with long term conditions included uh, within the uh, systematic review with a number of different uh, qualitative systematic uh, methodologies um, from, you know, an, a number of different countries. So. In terms of the, the, the main themes, um, three kind of main areas came out really uh, understanding emotional distress um, experiences of emotional distress and help seeking behavior for emotional distress. And I won't go into in, into all of the themes in detail, but I'll just pull out some examples uh, from each of these three areas. So understanding of emotional distress, the, a non non medical terminology was used and people use this word tension. For example, one uh, participant described I got it or I got diabetes from tension after my husband's death and participants may have uh, sometimes described sui suicidality and they actually tried to, you know, to kill themselves, but they wouldn't describe a, a mental health diagnosis. They wouldn't say depression or anything like that. They'd say tension. Um, in terms of experiences, there were multiple forms of inequality uh, and, you know, strong example of this. A, pa a participant said poverty causes illness and illness causes poverty. Cultural challenges and distress were discussed. For example, one participant said, yes, in our Indians, we take a lot of tension and acculturation was discussed. The challenge of moving across cultures and all of the uh, the stresses and anxieties and difficulties that come across with that. And gender differences were, were strong. One, one participant said, obviously, as a man, the first thing you think about is money. I don't want someone to support me. I feel humiliated. And this was around his his diagnosis uh, of having a, a heart attack, myocardial infarction. In terms of management, people turned to friends and family uh, and they turned to faith. For example, if you have strong faith, that gives you strength in order to endure the situation and overcome it and adjust it. And they didn't feel that clinical support was helpful, saying doctors are not helping us, describing healthcare professions as rude, discriminatory and uncaring. So just before going on to the qualitative study, I did, when I discussed this with the PPIE group, they said, yeah, we agree with all of those themes, but there's some things that we think are really missing. Um, and these were things that that we ensured to include in the qualitative study. They said, what, what about black magic? You know, in our community, a lot of those kind of uh, distress and, and mental health problems are related to that. And, and that was really quite interesting for me because as a South Asian, that is within my culture, but I hadn't thought about it in a research context. So I, we did include that within the interviews and I'll talk about um, that a bit later on. So the qualitative study um, was in, involved uh, interviewing both South Asian men with long term conditions as well as GPs. Um, trying to get more of an understanding uh, around experiences, seeking, seeking help and conceptualizations of emotional distress. Uh, and we did semi-structured semi interviews uh, and thematic analysis and recruited 17 men of South Asian origin with diabetes and or heart disease uh, and 18 GPs. Um, it, it looks a bit fuzzy, I hope you can read that. Um, but there were three kind of main um, themes that came out that that uh, were broken down. Um, but the first was contextualizing 
uh, emotional distress? How did uh, South Asians understand emotional distress? And, th and that included um, living with the long term conditions uh, and the social determinants of distress, um, such as prejudice and others. And then uh, contextualizing, uh, sorry, the first was contextualizing distress and then conceptualizing distress. So their perceptions, multiple identities and faith. And then the third consulting for distress. Um, co which in involved co-navigating uh, health beliefs, relationship based care and community engagement. So I'll just give some uh, a few quotes to really flesh out some of those uh, understandings. So the social determinants uh, of distress were, were, were really important. Um, for example, one partic uh, a GP participant said, sadly, many present and the triggers to their presentation tend to be, again, socioeconomic reasons. So they've got financial issues, employment issues, problems with their relationships. Um, and the thread that links all of this across communities beyond South Asian communities, uh, I think, is deprivation. And then in terms of co-navigating health beliefs, th this is a, a theme that came out with the patient advisory group because I thought it was about navigating and understanding um, the health beliefs of of the of of the, that South Asian patient in front of me in a way. Um, but actually, one of the PPIE group, he put his hand up and, and said to the effect that it's not about navigating health beliefs. My health beliefs uh, are not an iceberg that a ship has to sail around. Actually, GPs have health beliefs and their patients have health beliefs and there has to be a shared understanding. Um, so so this kind of theme really came out of, of, of that discussion. Um, one participant, a South Asian, uh, described uh, if you feel like you're talking, if just with talking to a GP, it's going to be so long, they probably won't know what's going on because there's so much cultural baggage that comes with it sometimes. It's just so hard to explain, to be honest. I feel that they probably truly won't understand it properly. And then uh, a GP described being able to identify with that group of uh, patients and understanding them, having an appreciation of their wants and needs is really helpful. If you can't connect with people, if you're not culturally competent, you might as well waste your time. It's like prescribing Prozac to someone who just bins it and walks out the door. You might be thinking you're doing well, and yes, you've written beautiful notes in your record that the powers that be can look at, but actually you've made absolutely zero difference to the community of people you serve. And then in terms of consulting uh, for distress, there were some some kind of key concepts that came out were around relationship based care uh, and community engagement. So uh, one participant described around kind of relationship based care is and, and trusting the uh, the clinician. It's not something that happens overnight. The professional trust, the professional bond between patient and service provider. It's not something that happens overnight. It takes time and effort and it takes patience to build that relationship. You don't just suddenly start offloading to your GP without any kind of trust building time. And then thinking about working uh, with communities. A GP uh, described, uh, you have to stop leaving healthcare in in the GP surgery. I'll say that the target area, targeted areas should be community centres, mosques and temples. So. What impact in a way can this research have uh, in, in, in terms of primary care? So I would consider that primary care may be culturally relevant or risks being irrelevant. And I think actually that being culturally relevant doesn't just apply to ethnic communities. I think it applies to everybody, um, including your white British person who, who has their own cultural backgrounds and understandings. And, and GPs have to, or clinicians in primary care, have to understand uh, and think about and address that. Otherwise, they risk becoming irrelevant, particularly when dealing with distress and, and mental health issues. Co-navigating care can build trust uh, between patients and GPs as part of relationship based care. So not just thinking about the other, the other, you know, the patient's understanding, but thinking me as a clinician, what is my understanding? What is this patient's understanding and how can we come to a shared uh, management plan? And a lens of cultural safety uh, could improve care uh, on a practice based level. Um, 
and cultural health capital is an approach to building trust on a community level so that services are embedded within engage and empower communities so thinking about really going to, to to participants and from different communities on their terms and and trying to deliver healthcare in a way suitable with them so what is in a way i think a message to myself uh, and others that i've learned when working uh, with with ethnic minorities over the last few years with this project um I, I kind of thought about having hikma. Hikma in a number of different languages, it means wisdom. Um, and some some points that I I, I wanted to really bring up uh, for researchers is firstly to have humility um, and having humility really some an, an example of, of that was even though kind of I am a South Asian, I left that a lot of my cultural understandings behind when I was the researcher and really having this understanding that people of different backgrounds of different cultures are experts. I might be an expert in my methodology or in my background, but they are an experts. They are experts in their living. So, how you know, having humility, um, I think, is incredibly important and the first step really for, you know, for researchers to do any uh, any good uh, and quality work. Information sharing, I, this is on different levels. But I think for one for me uh, was dissemination, uh, how to actually get my findings to the South Asian community. So my my uh, part, uh, patient advisory group were very keen on an animation that we built together. And I remember so sometimes when building the animation, animation, there are actually bits that I wanted to do differently to the to the patient advisory group. But I I, I felt my role was more to facilitate the way that they felt was best in terms of dissemination. Um, so that was really an, an, an insightful experience. Collaboration, um, working together with people of different backgrounds, I think is really important. And I keep, you know, I've talked a bit about the participation uh, advisory group, the participation advisory group, the, par the participant advisory group, actually because they were integral. And for me, they were they were the drivers uh, of, of really guiding me to make sure that my, my research um, w w uh, w was helpful. Community outreach, I think, is 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 absolutely essential. Uh, and this is this for me is about going out to different communities on their terms. Don't call them to my university to be in, you know, in my building, in my office. No, go out to their centres, go out where they're comfortable uh, and approach them on their terms. Manage sensitivities. Um, sometimes, you know, we often talk about how people from different ethnic communities uh, have a lack of trust, uh, and sometimes we think that it's it's their problem. Um, but actually, we really need to manage sensitivities, manage cultural understandings. When I studied the philosophy of social sciences as as, as part of my uh, PhD, it was quite interesting to learn how anthropology came about I, I, as a way of of how we can a British can rule. Uh, African black people. So, you know, the, so the almost the concept, many concepts of research have come out from quite um, fr neg negative backgrounds. So when different communities have a lack of trust, it's not always their problem and their fault, but we have to kind of understand uh, and manage uh, sensitivities. Applicability um, is just thinking about research ensuring that it's applicable and relevant to different communities. It was easy for me in terms of doing research about South Asians particularly. So so there were many that were keen to do that, but all research should be reflective of all the community that it serves. Um, and and the, the, the T in, in HICMA is to have a thriving research culture um, that supports uh, people from different backgrounds to get involved in research in in, in different levels as um, PPIE, as researchers, as funders on all different levels really to develop, not just to look for that diversity, but to develop uh, that diversity. Um, so there's a few uh, other links if, uh, if this will be um, shared. Um, and I'll play the uh, animation video that, that the group created in a minute. Um, and just before I do that, a big thank you to um, to my supervisors, uh, Carolyn, Tom, Nadia, and the Kiel Research uh, User Group, uh, and welcome uh, for funding me. Um, so I will just play the animation now, and then we'll be happy to take any questions after that.
share screen. Can you just confirm that you can see my screen? Yeah. Great, thank you. I felt a lot of tension. I was having family problems, lost my job, and was tired of managing my health problems. I worried how I'd pay bills and look after my family, but I wasn't sure how to get help. I prayed and spoke to my faith leader and my family, who advised me to speak to my GP. I trust my GP. He came to our center before and talked about dealing with tension. I made an appointment and went with my wife. The GP listened to me, cared, listened to what my problems were. He asked how I cope, like talking to family, prayer, and seeing friends in the temple or mosque. He supported me with treatment, understanding my background and culture, treatment I'm willing to do, and he has followed up. If you suffer from tension and emotional stress, see your GP for support. You can speak to them about what is making you distressed and what could help you, like your faith and family and NHS services and treatments. They can help work with you to make a treatment plan based on your choices and what will help you. Um, so, yeah, great. Thank you and, and happy to take any questions. Thanks, Hassan. E excellent presentation. I um, feel like we need a, a round of applause, really, and not just a virtual one. So, yeah, happy to, to field some questions for Hassan. No, it's up all questions in the chat, that's fine. Carolyn. Yeah, a really good presentation and fab video. I was interested to Sam that you said when you were working with your advisory group that they had certain views and you had other views about what should appear in the video. And I just wonder if you could give us a concrete example of that and, and how you resolved it. Uh, yeah, so I mean, I guess just one example was when, when we talked about the um, the patient voice, um, the patient advisory group uh, felt that it was important to have an authentic Asian voice. Um, so then from um, the kind of the animation company that developed it, they, they, they sent a number of voices and there was kind of, there were a few um, quite traditional uh, uh, Asian accents that I kind of really thought would would be helpful um in this and 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 when i sent them to the patient advisory group they said oh no actually if you put in these accents people will just think it's you know it, it's 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 for people that have just come to this country um and and it's for first generation people but actually so they they wanted that authentic voice but they didn't want it to be too um too strong so i kind of i just remember biting my lip thinking oh i prefer that one but actually, this is um, this is what the patient advisory group feel. And I want my research or I want this animation video not just to be representative of what I uh, what I think will be helpful to the to this community. But I want it to be representative of what this community themselves feel uh, is representative to them. And like I said, it, it was quite interesting because I'm, I'm South Asian uh, as well. But I did feel at times there was. A cultural distance because I was presenting as a researcher first and foremost and whether I like it or not you know I don't know that part of my brain kind of just switched off when I was doing other bits um, so yeah I hope, I hope that helps. Yeah thank you there's also a message from Alex Morley oh you put it in the chat that's great Alex about getting this message out so maybe Hassan and, and Ali, Alex can link up afterwards so that you can send the link. So I'm yeah. going to shut it now. Yeah, uh, we can um, negotiate that company thing, Hassan. Um, so Jane, I think your hand was up next. Yeah. You're on you're mute. mute. Jane, you are mute. Yeah, you're on mute, Jane. I'm so sorry. Um, I was going to say it's not a question. It was just a comment to say it's great to hear that you you listened and took on board despite your own feelings 
um, your advisory group um, because that means a lot to to patient and public sitting on a group that they're not you know they are actually listened to and also you're saying you know you're getting out into the communities and going and speaking to people where they feel comfortable and um, because I think that's really important as well but great and I love the animation great thank you thank you Jane and Saeed Hi, um, just a, sorry, just a comment. Um, has, sorry. Uh, I, I really liked your this um, hikmah, uh, which I understand is Urdu and Arabic word for the wisdom. Great. I think it 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 can potentially become a framework for doing research with the ethnic minorities. So really good. Yeah, th thank you. One of the kind of the plans is is to uh, write up a paper around kind of PPA involvement. So I'm hoping to kind of have something like this um, in uh, in it. Thank you for that. Natalie heard the word framework, I think, so she's jumped on that. Yeah, love it. Hi, Hassan. Really great presentation. It's great to hear it in context, having met you a while ago when I first started um, to hear how things have progressed. Um, um, I love the, yeah, I love that hikmat, um, especially the element where you talk about um, the connection with history. I think it was around the applicability or around the trust as well and um, how historical context is so important. Um, and looking back at that sort of um, the, the thing, in order, in order to understand and have humility, having that understanding of the context, um, thought it was really, yeah, it's great to hear that it's going to be potentially written about more and potentially a framework. It's, yeah, just wanted to make that comment. Thanks, Natalie. Just got one more question in the, the chat from Joanna. Uh, so what came first, the question or the desire to do a PhD? There's an interesting um, story behind that, actually, isn't there? Yeah, I mean, I, I've always wanted to go into research and help, you know, uh, underserved communities. So the opportunity came out to actually do a PhD around loneliness in, in elderly people, um, you know, that Carolyn and others were heading. And, and I applied for that PhD and I got that PhD. And then when I kind of started, um, we kind of it was discussed actually you know that that research question has moved on a bit and different people have have come and gone at keel and and things so they said actually, let's start again from from the drawing board so i i kind of i had had my phd had started it on 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 what i thought would be a specific topic and and we said okay and, and my supervisor said look we need to start again um so obviously based on kind of shared interest we we, we came to that so in a way, I think on my on my journey, actually, it was the PhD that came first uh, and the research question that came afterwards. But that happened in quite a, you know, a, a natural and unplanned way. And in hindsight, I wouldn't have had it any other way because I felt I was really able to um, obviously within the realms of my, my supervisory uh, ex uh, team expertise, I was really able to to develop that in, in, in an area of interest that I thought I could really contribute. Thanks, Hassan. Uh, just one more question in the chat and then we'll, we'll move on to, to Aaron, although I realise we might cross over the 11 o'clock um, time, so apologies, Alan, Aaron, if we have to um, cut into your presentation. Um, so the question in the chat was, um, I'm not sure if you mentioned this, Hassan, but um, how did you find recruiting people for interviews, um, as this is something we have struggled with? For me, the PPIE group did my recruitment. I need, you know, they i they did what i kind of didn't think about so they said for for example the poster itself um they gave me a lot of feedback on that to actually you know make us feel it's for us so part of that was actually just adding a picture of a south asian man but then okay what where do i put this poster you know okay yeah community centers faith centers and and they agreed with that they said you need to go to this grocery shop this grocery shop and this grocery because this is where all the asians go to buy groceries you know, if you if you want to get Asians from a different mix, that's where you need to go. Um, radio stations, you know, um, they said to go on kind of Asian based radio stations that to be honest, I'm you know, I'm I'm from Manchester. I don't really know kind of the local Keel Stoke type radio station. They said you need to go on this radio station. This radio, this is what we Asians listen to. Um, so uh, so for me, actually, my recruitment strategy, I had ideas. And some of those were, were were played, but actually a lot of it really was driven by the local PPIE group that knew the local community much better than I did. 
Um, so actually, thankfully for me, recruitment wasn't as as challenging as 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 I thought it may be. Thanks, Hassan. And you did some really good work as well with your PPIE group, didn't you, in terms of getting a culturally relevant group together, uh, which I think was a new thing really for, for Keel. OK, so we're, we're back. So I'm going to hand over to Aaron to deliver his presentation to you. Great, thanks, Tom. I'll just get the slides up on the screen. Um, does that does that all look OK? Can you hear me and see the slides OK? Yeah, okay. yeah, that's great. Uh, thanks, brilliant. Um, well, yeah, thank you. Thank you for coming this morning. Thank you for your attention. Um, my name is Sam Poppleton. As mentioned, I'm a GP in the northwest of England. I'm also doing a welcome funded PhD at the School of Medicine in Keele University. Um, my research is entitled Clarence, um, which stands for Culturally Adapting Primary Care Mental Health for the UK, Central and Eastern European Community. That's it, something's gone wrong, there we go. So um, why focus on this community? Well, um, as of last year, over 5 million EU citizens have applied for the UK settlement scheme within the UK. Um, a significant proportion of those are from Central and Eastern Europe um, and have arrived within the UK in, in, within the last two, 20 years. Um, I've put a, bit, a table there just to give a bit of an indication of numbers. Those figures have changed a bit over the last two years, um, but we can see that there are substantial um, numbers of individuals from, from Poland, Romania, Lithuania, and a range of other um, Central and Eastern European countries. Um, of note, over the last year, we've seen a significant increase in the number of Ukrainians who have come to the UK, um, and also other communities as well um, from the Balkans, um, such as Albania. There's the question of well, what is life like for these individuals living within the UK? And actually, for some, it's great. There can be new work or personal opportunities to be explored. Um, but actually, for a substantial number, um, life can be quite hard. Um, and there is data to suggest that there are higher rates of mental, mental health disorders, um, including depression, suicide, alcohol and substance misuse, um, and domestic violence within these communities. Um, and that's not to neglect the significant events of the last couple of years, including Brexit, um, the COVID pandemic and associated lockdowns, um, and the conflict in Ukraine, all of which have direct relevance to community members. So my research aims to build and develop um, the evidence um, and interventions to allow primary care to effectively meet the mental health needs of the Central and Eastern European community in the UK. In terms of the structure of my research, uh, it's four stages. Um, the first stage is to speak with um, community members um, and a broad representation of community members as well, um, just to understand their, their perspectives on this. Um, next. Um, is for GP um, staff member interviews. And I think as Hassan sort of hinted at, it's, it's not just for clinicians, but actually the whole practice team as part of that. Um, so yes, GPs, nurses and other healthcare professionals, um, but also receptionists, managers, and the people that make the system work as part of that. And I'm gonna be interviewing individuals that have trained in the UK and also those that have trained within Central and Eastern Europe as well. Um, these are gonna inform the ongoing co-design of the project. So working closely with community members and healthcare practitioners um, to develop interventions that can help to improve access and quality of care. Um, and then trialing and refining these in practice, thinking what works, how can we make it have the most positive impact possible. So I started off my PhD um, wanting to find out, well, actually, what is the situation for community members? You know, I'd seen in my practice that there were a number of challenges and, and difficulties, uh, but what, what does the data suggest? Um, and actually, there's not a lot of high quality research relating to this community within the UK. Um, so I did a broad scoping review to see what was out there um, and included a lot of grey literature. So that's report from th reports from third sector organisations, community groups and um, local government, just to get a bit of a better idea um, about primary care access and also mental health care within that. Um, I've worked quite closely with a number of um, community organisations um, and also community groups um, just to understand more about their perspective of this. Um, and what might be the ways forwards in terms of healthcare. I've also spoken with a number of healthcare uh, professionals to understand things from perhaps the other side to see how our health culture affects um, access and provision of care within the UK. And I've collaborated with a number of organisations. I'm very grateful for um, some of the members who are here today um, and they've been extremely helpful with that, as well as some researchers who are looking into 
this, this topic. So the, the questions for my interviews um, largely focus around exploring what Central and Eastern Europeans narratives are of living in the UK. So their stories, what they've experienced have been through, um, whether they've had challenges to their well-being and experiences of distress as part of that, um, and also any sort of engagement or sort of encounters they've had with GP services, particularly in terms of mental health and well-being. Um, now, we've talked a little bit about in, sort of increasing or encouraging sort of um, minority ethnic groups and their participation in research. Um, Central and Eastern Europeans are commonly described as being a hard to reach group. Um, however, that didn't seem to be the case when I was chatting with a number of members from the community um, who didn't feel that they were hard to reach, just that often the way that the research was structured wasn't um, easily accessible for them. Um, so they helped me um, quite significantly in terms of promoting the study and ways to get the, sort of the message out there. That included translating materials and promotional materials into a wide range of different languages. Um, also, they sort of gave me guidance in terms of how to um, get a representation of the whole community and not just those that are more typically resent represented within research. And they were helpful in designing the, the research structure as well in terms of keeping things flexible and um, timings of interviews, formats of interviews, what things worked for for community members, um, and then also looking at incentivizing it, thinking, well, actually, how can um, I make it worth their while to take part? And that was really helpful from that side. Um, I've interviewed 23 people, um, 12 of which are, are women, um, and the research employs a, what's called a constructivist approach. So it's quite a sort of a bottom up approach. I've got some questions that I asked, but actually a lot of the direction of the interview is guided by the people that I'm speaking with, knowing what's important to them um, and their experiences. Analysis is ongoing and I'm employing a thematic analysis approach. Um, I've included a word cloud beneath um, just to try and represent some of the diversity and, and differences we've seen within the community. Um, so certainly there are differences in terms of nationality, but there's also lots of variations in terms of education, time in the UK, language, accommodation situation, um, relationships, ability to access healthcare, religion, faith, um, sort of other sort of identifications in terms of subgroups within that. Um, yeah, huge variety in terms of the community and the people that I've spoken with. In terms of some of the results that are starting to come out from the interviews, um, so as alluded to at the beginning, um, people do describe a lot of opportunities and challenges of living within the UK. Opportunities in terms of personal development, um, financial benefits, um, opportunities for work and also exploring culture. Um, but within that, there can be a number of difficulties as well that work, work can be hard, maybe not what they've expected, underemployment. Challenges understanding the culture within the UK, stress in terms of relationship, difficulties and breakdown, new health problems that come, um, difficulties grasping language, um, and also unique challenges that came as a result of COVID, Brexit, and also the conflict in Ukraine. More specifically, looking at the topic of well-being, distress, and using the GP, individuals reported a number of different ways they try and manage um, challenges to their well-being, um, and common things that came up. Um, included um, reliance on sort of family, often quite small family networks, um, sort of transient relationships of friends they've met along their, their journey in the UK, um, and also the place of faith and religion in terms of um, managing difficulties um, and, and coping with, with life. Um, there were another other, a number of other things that came up. The importance of work was a repeated issue, that that was why a number of people had come to the UK and that was their core reason for, um, yeah, for being here. Still. Um, it was also sort of reliance on community organisations um, and a feeling of just needing personal resilience as well through difficulties, something which was said to come with, with time. Um, gender norms were also quite um, frequently talked as a way of finding sort of comfort and identity. Alcohol was a very common topic that was raised, uh, sometimes at small levels, but often at quite high levels of consumption, um, and that in turn linked with issues to do with um, coping and mental health and employment and a whole range of other factors. And um, drugs were also mentioned by a number of individuals as well. And the topic of culturally familiar healthcare, often outside of the NHS, was described by a number of, of individuals, um, although that, that did vary based on a number of different factors. Some people mentioned using their GP, um, often with quite mixed um, perceptions and experiences of that with relation to well-being and distress. So a few, few quotes from individuals um, I've, I've interviewed in terms of their views on general practice. Um, there was a strong preference towards face-to-face -face contact with the GP. Um, feeling that actually you couldn't get a proper assessment if you hadn't been seen face to face and the pandemic was a huge challenge for that. Um, people talked about a lot of variation and difficulty knowing what to expect, um, not just in terms of within sort of their own communities and sort of different health views, but also when they go to the GP, they felt that there was a huge, as Hassan sort of alluded to, sort of culture within healthcare, but actually that was quite different between the different people they were seeing within healthcare 
and, and hard to predict that. Um, and an overarching feeling of just not being taken seriously, that they raised their health concerns, often at perceived points of crisis, and actually they just didn't feel that they were addressed, both as a person or as indeed the, the health presenting complaints that they brought to the GP. In terms of mental health, um, there's some quite uh, a range of different views that came out, but the common things seem to feel that mental health issues or distress or difficulties with well-being um, were reactive to um, challenges within their life. And actually, that was the, the core reason for them feeling the way they did. Um, and that's something that you need to address primarily rather than medicalising the problem. Um, there was a lot of stigma talking about difficulties and feeling that you weren't maybe managing as well as you wanted to within the UK. Um, and suicide in particular was something that just was people found very difficult to talk about with um, with with friends, with family, um, and, and even to some degree within, within the interviews as well. Um, as I mentioned, alcohol was commonly seen as a coping mechanism for distress. Um, and, and I guess finally, in terms of mental health, a number of participants really struggled to say what mental health was or what it meant to them, um, to put a definition to it. And for those that did, actually there was a question as to whether the GP really could do anything about it. Looking more specifically at in what last sort of two, three years and the impact of Brexit, COVID and Ukraine, um, it did seem to have a huge impact on community members, although the, that varied depending on a range of factors. Um, individuals felt that their identity had been taken a hit. Uh, often they felt they'd been unwelcomed. Uh, a few people described um, sort of, sort of judgments or, or even um, yeah, very different views that people had expressed towards them since, since Brexit in particular. It also shaped their feeling of whether they wanted to stay in the UK long term. Um, their views of authority, particularly the governments and, and healthcare providers as well, they felt they'd been shaken, that they felt that they couldn't trust them. Um, there was limited trust to start with, but that had been exacerbated because of these events. Um, there were huge impacts in terms of employment, particularly with COVID and lockdown. Individuals didn't know how or what their rights were or how to maintain their employment, and particularly those in casual or insecure employment found that, that often dried up and that then had knock-on effects for further aspects of their health and well-being. Coping mechanisms were also disrupted, difficulty um, sort of contacting family, inability to travel home um, and engage maybe with healthcare back in, in sort of their, their home nations as well um, had direct implications for their health. And, and of course, a, a shift towards remote access of healthcare was very difficult for a number of individuals and they weren't able to access health services as a result. I've mentioned briefly about variation and certainly there was variation responses according to gender and financial situation and also nation, nation of origin. Um, however, across across these groups, there seems to be um, I've kind of termed a spectrum of capital, that there are some people that when they come to the UK um, have higher levels of maybe social capital, educational capital, um, other sorts of resources that they can draw on that allow them to navigate a number of these difficulties. Um, but actually, there is a spectrum within that. Um, and there are some people that find these things a lot harder and actually don't have things that they can draw on um, and reach crisis points, um, maybe um, either more quickly or over a prolonged period of time and difficulty accessing the services um, and that's something that yeah, I'm keen to explore a bit further that one size doesn't fit all actually there is huge variation in terms of mental health well-being and ability to access services so I guess the question is so with this information so what what difference is it going to make um, so one of the key things I'm trying to do as I mentioned is there isn't a lot of evidence out there from which to, to build and develop strategies to help improve access and care um, so I'm trying to get things published by a range of different formats, um, both the academic sort of literature, but also looking at more sort of soft publications, blogs, magazine articles, uh, sort of websites and community events, just to try and um, share this knowledge and, and yeah, make it more of an open topic for discussion. Um, in terms of the staff member interviews that are going to be starting shortly, I'm trying to understand from a health system perspective what sort of aspects of health culture and, and systems need to be worked with um, to improve that. Um, these factors are all going to shape a theoretical model of, of mental health, belief and engagement in terms of services to try and provide a more academic foundation to, to make those changes. Um, this coming together is what's going to help or continue to, to shape the co-design process where we're going to think about interventions that can really make, make a difference um, to access and quality of primary care, but particularly in terms of mental health. And then seeing actually what do we need to do to refine this to make sure that it's not just a one-off thing, but something that does lead to a lasting change in, in care and access. In terms of how that looks, so there's, there's ongoing discussions with, with community members and also healthcare workers on that. I can see broadly it's going to be falling into three, three categories, looking at ways to improve and um, support community engagement. Um, so 
partly in terms of that sort of health education and awareness of services and also participation in research as part of that. Um, looking at how health structures are, are, are sort of developed, so patients' experiences of engaging with, with care and how that can be supported and facilitated, um, and also that they can play an active role within that, so there is a real voice in terms of shaping um, the culture and systems within UK primary care. Um, and then also thinking about how we can train up clinicians um, to provide more culturally appropriate um, and um, effective care within that, so looking at um, sort of guidelines in terms of cross-cultural or cross-cultural mental health care, consultation sort of methods and skills, um, and also um, what aspects maybe are transferable to other, other cultures as well. Um, so not just for this community, but thinking more broadly in terms of primary care. So I wanted to, to finish with a fictional patient um, who one of my um, collaborators has kindly voiced for me called Magda, um, just to share a little bit as to where I hope this research is going. My life was hard when I came to the UK from Poland. I worked so many hours and my husband and I argued all the time. I felt down and very stressed. Things got so bad that I started drinking alcohol and I even thought about ending my life. But then I booked a convenient GP appointment with translation. The GP, uh, she actually listened. She understood my distress and hopelessness. She recommended treatment that I understood and agreed with. She showed me even Polish resources, some helpful well-being organizations and community support. Now I feel I have hope and support to live through the difficulties in my life. I even started helping others who came to the UK from Poland. So, so just to summarise, um, there are um, comparatively high levels of unmet mental health needs within the UK Central and Eastern European community. Um, and that's compounded by um, underuse of GP services and often dissatisfaction when services are engaged with. My research is seeking to explore this further. Um, and also to look at culturally adapting GP care, and particularly in terms of mental health, and to improve quality and access for Central and Eastern Europeans in the UK. And, and I'm doing this by working closely together with community members and also um, healthcare practitioners um, to co-design approaches um, that can enable that, not just in the short term, um, but also sustainability, stay sustainably, sustainably um, going forwards. Thank you for your attention. Um, I've popped my email and also sort of link to the project website on the slide. Um, I'm more than happy to, to chat for any questions now or later by email. And yeah, thank you for your time. Thanks, Aaron. Another excellent presentation and round of applause all round. Um, so we've got one question in the chat already, which is a request for the slides, if you could share those. Um, and I think the same goes for Hassan as well, if we're able to share the slides with everyone, that would be great. Um, Do you have any questions for, for Aaron? any hands I'll ask you I'll ask a question Aaron um did anything surprise you during your research um yeah so I think one of the couple of surprises um one is that actually while there are quite significant cultural differences between um I guess sort of maybe nations or sort of sort of groups kind of within this community actually the, a lot of challenges seem to kind of transcend those um, and not not just socioeconomic status there's a range of different kind of factors within that but sort of commonalities of experiences of coming to the UK difficulties with employment um, difficulties accessing support um, barriers to kind of seeing their GP or at least getting health care that they feel they can kind of relate to from their GP was a sort of surprised that there's such there was such similarity between different groups despite you know, different languages different home of healthcare systems and arriving in the UK at different times. Um, yes, that was a, a real surprise. Um, I think in terms of other things, and that's something which, um, yeah, is an interesting and there's always need for more research, is that just how things change over time, that actually culture isn't static, it's not you know, one size fits all forever. Actually, things do change 
and over the course of the preparation of the PhD and the, and the PhD itself, there's been, as I say, some, some big things that have happened. There's been COVID, there's been Brexit, there's been the conflict in Ukraine, a change in kind of migration rules in terms of the UK. Um, and all of those things have had impacts on the community, different extents to different parts of the community. Um, and as part of that, their view of healthcare services and also mental health with that as well. Um, so that's been kind of quite hard to kind of keep track on over time, but just seeing how it really is an evolving field. Um, and that migration itself is not a, a simple question, but often, so particularly with this community, maybe in difference to some other communities in the UK, um, there's this concept of cyclical migration. So actually it's not, it's a permanent move that's never going to be um, undone. Actually, a lot of people would come to the UK for a period of time, maybe go back, and it all depended on their life situation. If there were if the employment, how it was in the UK, if there was a sick relative back home, um, how easy it was to travel, if there were kids involved, um, there's a whole range of factors there that um, yeah, it's a lot more dynamic uh, maybe than perhaps I'd expected. Thanks, Aaron. We've got a question from Carol. Uh, I'm, I'm going to actually ask two questions, sorry. The first is, um, I agree with all the things you've said and, and in relation to what you've just been saying, did you consider housing? Because of course, at the moment, that, that is an issue for Ukrainians, certainly, um, and probably for other groups. And the second question is, you've talked about all these potential outputs. Will you actually mm -hmm. be able to create them or will you just provide recommendations to do so? Yeah, great questions. Uh, thanks, Carol. Um, so yes, housing was something that was considered. So I was keen to get a broad kind of representation within the community. Um, so I worked um, quite closely, I see Alex is on the call, um, with the Booth Centre that works with people with insecure accommodation in Manchester. Um, so sort of interviewing them to hear sort of their experiences and how how yeah, how their journeys have been in the UK and their situations um, and how, yeah, I guess accommodation and employment security kind of factored into that. Um, and also their ability to engage with healthcare services as a result of that. So if you don't have an address, you should still be able to see a GP, but it just make things a lot a lot harder. Your referral letters, you know, where are they going to go? When you go to the pharmacist, are they going to give you a prescription? How do you, you know, give your ID to kind of confirm that? Um, yeah, so that's a topical question, and particularly topical in terms of Ukrainians at the moment, where a large numbers have arrived and been supported under the Home for Ukraine scheme for the promise of six months, and those six months have now gone. There's a big question as to, to what next. Uh, there's a lot of anxiety and services surrounding that. Um, in terms of the second question in and outputs, um, so you're right, yeah, there's there's loads of things on that slide, and I'm, I'm yeah, <laughs> recognise I'm not going to be able to do do all of those. Um, a large part of it, I mean, so discussions with, as I say, a couple of different community groups just as to what they think is relevant from that side. Um, so I'm, I'm hoping once I've finished the interviews, I've got a better idea as to kind of the, the things that are emerging from there to then take that for discussion with them and say, OK, well, these are the things that seem to be coming out of the research. What do you really think about this? Do you think that's a big issue? Do you think that's going to continue to be a big issue? OK, how could we kind of work with that? And then doing a little bit of toing and froing between community members and sort of healthcare workers to see, well, actually, what what's deliverable in practice? The NHS has its own challenges at the moment. And perhaps this isn't always a priority from that side. So it's thinking actually what what is achievable. Um, yeah. So watch this space. <laughs> Sorry, can I just add to that? Can I just mm. respond to that? Because you you found and, and we also found that the um, the personal the family networks are very small although there are community networks so um compared to some other groups um it might be harder to draw on the community or not i don't know what you think about that because you've talked about the involvement of community organizations so. no no definitely um so um, family networks are quite small they're often quite fragmented and often become more fragmented being in the UK just because the huge amount of stress that people are under, the long working hours, the alcohol substance misuse, lack of normal support networks um, around them. So yeah, that's a, a big thing. Um, one thing which I'm sort of looking into a bit more is this idea of kind of um, the power of kind of informal contacts. Um, so often people would talk about, oh yeah, a friend pointed me towards this job, a friend kind of tipped me off on where I could stay, a friend told me about this sort of opportunity. And you dig a bit deeper and say, well, you know, what do you mean by a friend? And it's you know, just someone that they've met at a bus shelter or it's someone that they've happened to have, you know, worked one shift with. And they're very kind of fluid kind of relationships. There's um, you help me, I help you, but it's not 
a lot of kind of um, depth kind of contact that's that's there. Um, often social media is quite important. There's a lot of Facebook groups, um, a lot of, not things you'd expect, but kind of, you know, buy and sell kind of within this area for Romanians, for instance, or it's, yeah, sort of things of um, need, but actually through that, the sort of contacts and information shared. Um, yeah, and there are some organisations that are well trusted as well that people dip in and out of as they feel they kind of need to from that side. Um, yeah, I don't know if that fits with kind of your experience as well, but uh, yeah. Thanks, Carol. Some great questions there. Um, just got one more question from Alex. Um, how did the environment in which the interviews were conducted affect the content and was relationship building a key element to the research? Yeah, so um, as I say, the, the interviews were done in a, a range of different ways. Um, so some were sort of using sort of Teams and sort of Zooms, like video calls, some were telephone based, uh, some were face to face. Um, and that was based on what, what people wanted. So it was kind of shaped by that. Um, yeah, so so with, with the Booth Centre, all of those interviews were face to face. Um, and these were people who, as I say, had, had insecure sort of accommodation. Um, and actually, I think people, it was it was kind of a case of you do the interview then because actually there are lots lots of things going on in these individual lives um and so it had to be face to face had to be then otherwise you know it wasn't really possible or convenient for them um and um we, we tried to sort of do it in an environment where they sort of would, would feel sort of comfortable so that was at the center in sort of a room that was kind of um sort of separate from the main area but still sort of close by so it was um, hopefully not too much of kind of out of their sort of time or day or kind of plans from that side um Sometimes the interviews, um, people wanted to do it with a friend um, for kind of moral support or maybe to help kind of with, with language and sort of translation from there. That, so there was the opportunity to have a, an interpreter present at any of the interviews and some people took that up, some people didn't. Um, and so that was a factor, but there was definitely a different dynamic when there was sort of more than one person present. Um, people would sometimes be more than happy to talk about their lives. Sometimes they would talk about parts of their lives more than others. Um, and so that did shape things to some degree. Um, yeah, and that's a factor that I have to take into consideration. Um, but people wanted that sort of peer support um, to allow them to sort of feel more comfortable from that side. Um, I don't know if there's any other sorts of, sort of thoughts or comments. Um, people that were more willing to do it remotely um, tended to talk about this idea of capital. It tended to be people who had higher levels of educational attainment, English language fluency, had been in the UK for longer um more socioeconomically secure um so that definitely was was a factor within that thanks Aaron, and, and thanks to everyone for for the contributions um during the the meeting so we've come to half 11 now and um, i can see in the chat that hassan's um animation is being shared with everyone so that's really nice so hopefully some really good impact from that um so i think we'll draw it to a close i think um, that's okay but just to thank our our speakers again and to thank everyone for engaging um, it has been really helpful and hopefully learned, learned something from the, the two research projects there I think.